Welcome, divas and dudes, to Powerhouse Bakery. It's so nice to have you all. A little bit of rain out there, it feels so good, right? On the way over, it, it poured in Leon Springs, and then it was, you know, no rain at all, so little spurts. So today is the last in our series of looking at food additives. And I, I just feel like it can't really be the end because there's so many interesting things. So we'll take a break and we'll do some cooking coming up soon too, because um, I love to get to really apply what we're learning. So uh, in, the near, uh, in the next classes to come, we'll have lots of fun um, food samples and presentations. Um, but you know, in the food additives one, I had a hard time doing a lot of samples because um, it's kind of things that I didn't really want you to eat too much. Um, but I hope some of you have tried the fermented foods um, because that has just been a really exciting area for me. And, and again, um, this is a new category, right? Adding foods to preserve them and to imp increase the um, not only the shelf life, but the stability of the food, uh, the mixability so that it stays in solution, if you will. And um, what's really cool about the era that we're in is that sort of what used to go on behind closed doors in the food science world that nobody really asked about or understood is now opening the door and we're stepping through and we're starting to kind of see what in the heck are they doing to our food? Um, and a little aside, I was just reading about all this stuff and I learned about expeller pressed canola oil. Um, probably a lot of you have heard that canola oil is one of those that's questionable. You know, is it really a seed? Is it a genetic modification? It's really a cousin of the rapeseed oil, right? And, and um, so even before we get into this, I just have to share with you the expeller pressed. This whole idea that oil that comes from a either an olive or a canola seed, um, expeller press versus conventional. And again, there's food additives in there. If it's just pressed, like the olden days when we used to, you know, see grapes being pressed with our feet to get the juice, right? Similar idea with oil, you press out the seeds and that's the, the expeller press. There's actually a machine that's an expeller pressing device that uses a tremendous amount of pressure Whereas we used to use our feet, I suppose, or rocks. <laughs> uh, now we've got this special machine. If we don't have expeller pressed, what is the traditional or the you know standard, I should say, way? And that's with a chemical, a solution, a solvent called hexane. And so the seeds are pressed into a paste and then they're bleached and cleaned with this chemical called hexane. And then, and then using heat, it uh, extracts as much of the hexane as possible, which of course is, you know, they say they get all of it out, but then the, one, the, the group of people and advocates that are against traditional methods of getting oil from seeds say, no, 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 you're not getting it all out. That's not good. Um, it, you know, uses high heat. It basically has to um, cause the oil to um, evaporate, or I'm sorry, the hexane evaporates and it leaves just the oil. But, you know, does it really get it all? And, you know, we, we don't know what we don't know. So we have been using oils for, you know, many years, thinking that they're perfectly fine. It's just an oil, right? That's all the ingredient tells us. And no, there's probably all kinds of residue. So some research says as little as five parts per million or as much as 25 parts per million in an oil that we thought was just one ingredient. But the way that it's been processed, changes the equation. So that's really why I think this is such a fun topic to learn about, be informed. So today what I wanted to do is kind of finish up, but also again, open the door and realize that there's a whole bunch more that we can look at and really uh, continue to research. And the other side of that is I don't want us to be um, so scared that we're afraid to use foods. I still believe in the best foods list mentality that portion, frequency of using foods is still a really big part of it. And I always, always want us to keep evolving towards minimally processed foods, but it doesn't mean we need to be, um, you know, fanatics and scared of using other products, just as little as we can. So I think that's a fair, fair way to kind of present it. So what I wanted to talk about today was gums and thickeners. 
so anybody think of any gums or thickeners that are in products? And moreover, what products are they in? Yeah, guar gum. We talked about that one a little bit already. The, the one that's also in the news a lot is carrageenan. And uh, that one we're going to talk about a bit. But then there's also ones that are kind of more traditional. Anybody ever make jellies and jams at home? Pectin. And then here at Paras Bakery, we use chia seeds. We also use arrowroot. Yeah, and what's the common one when you want to thicken up a gravy? Cornstarch. Yeah, cornstarch. And if you were in uh, France and you were making a roux, what would you use to thicken? Flour, yep. Old world flour. So even in you know my gluten-free world, we could use a flour. We could use rice flour if we wanted to. And then we could go on that bunny trail and go, oh no, but rice has, you know, chemicals in it too, the way it's processed, right? I mean, you could really go in a bunny hole on all this and never come out. So, you know, we always have to realize that there's some things that we can't change and some things that we need to have a loud voice to change and then use our mighty dollar to change those others. So needless to say, there's all kinds of things that are used to make foods a better texture. Um, can you think of a food you love that has a really good thick texture? Yogurt, right? What about some of the non-dairy milks? Anybody use almond milk? No? Even um, things like chocolate milk. I know. I have, to, I have to confess, I had a chocolate milk the other day. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I, oh my gosh, probably not for 10 years at least. And uh, I bought one at a, I was at a um, gas station and you know, they have all those drinks and you know, how do you pick the best thing at a gas station? And that thing was going boom, 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 come get me, right? And so of course I had to pick out what's the healthiest one. And I looked at the ingredients and I picked this one that was pretty clean. Oh my goodness, it was delicious. Um, I only drank half, just, you know, got to put that out there. Um, so these are foods that we kind of have an expectation. They're going to be creamy and um, kind of slide down your throat and you get to enjoy the coolness and the flavors. And there's all those components that the manufacturers go, if we do this to this food, they're going to have that reaction like I did with that chocolate milk thinking this is heaven on earth, right? Ice creams, um, so much ice creams are gonna wanna have this good quality. Now what natural ingredient will do that? Cream, cream and sugar for sure and butter. But, but when thinking of dairies, cream certainly adds viscosity, which is the thickening and it adds that creamy mouth feel. Anybody ever make homemade ice cream? Yeah. Do we add a thickener, a convention? We add carrageenan or pectin or guar gum to homemade ice cream? Not a chance, right? It's all about how well the small particle, particulars of cream and the frozen quality melts in your mouth. So you got to get a lot of um, ice and a lot of rock salt and you got to churn it for a long time. And it makes this wonderful quality that we love to melt in our mouth food scientists don't want to take that long and they sure don't want to spend that much money on good quality ingredients. So they have found techniques that will cut corners and they're always going to be in a battle of cost and customer acceptance. So what's kind of cool is right now customer acceptance has this big issue going on. We want healthy. Now granted, we don't know what healthy actually means. But like when I got my chocolate milk, what did I do? I looked at the ingredients and I tried to make sure it didn't have carrageenan and didn't have, you know, pectins and gelatins and la la la. I wanted just cream and milk and then get the low fat version to boot. And yeah, it's gonna have some sugar. Did it have organic sugar, right? So all those things, we care about healthy. At least a lot of us do. In fact, during my research for this class, uh, I read an astonishing number that the organics industry is a $50 billion industry. 
So money does talk for sure. Money does talk for sure. So we want to make sure that we understand what we're buying and why, um, and making sure that we've got as many understandings and knowledge around what we pick and why. Okay, so carrageenan is one that we're going to talk about quite a bit today. But needless to say, the dairy products are not the only ones that have thickeners and a rationale for improving the texture of foods. Guess where else they show up? In meats. So not only um, deli meats like Applegate Farms is one of them that is a deli meat that is considered organic that definitely has flavor enhancers. And so using some carrageenan or products similar to this are gonna help the mouthfeel. So Applegate Farms, not to call out one particular one, it's just the one I remember from the list. Um, it's considered organic, it's considered healthy, it's considered low fat and probably nitrate free, that kind of thing. So. They're gearing towards this person, right? But the mouth feel is gonna be off if it doesn't have the right amount of texture. It's gonna have, it needs to feel like it's a little bit fatty, even though it's not, right? Like I drink that chocolate milk, I wanted to have all those good qualities. And yet there's this balance of what the ingredients are and what our palate really wants. And so when I get a brand new person in that's trying to eat gluten-free and they say, oh my gosh, it's so different. What am I gonna do without my dot, dot, dot? Well, their palate's not used to it. So that's where I think we're headed is, you know, I think we can live without some of these additives if our palate gets acclimated to something different. But needless to say, these gums and thickeners show up in meats and meat um, alternatives. So we'll talk a little bit about the Beyond Meat and the Beyond Beef. Uh, yogurts, of course, all the creamy ingredients. Did you know that even cottage cheese is in this lineup? Yeah, so kind of interesting. And again, because cottage cheese is known to separate. And so some of these products, and again, not all of them. I mean, not all of them, but some of them are gonna have this in there. Um, Oftentimes stores will decide whether or not they're gonna carry products that have gums and thickeners. Can you think of a, a store that is really strict about this? Whole Foods is probably the worst and Trader Joe's. They have all kinds of things that Sprouts I think is a little stricter and uh, natural grocers. I tried to get my products into natural grocers and they are so strict that even my products they, I have to go through all these testings. So the Natural Grocers Association is similar to um, the Retail Grocers Association. There, there's an organization that decides what do we want to buy into? What kind of customer do we want to attract? And so a Natural Grocers is gonna attract the high-end customer that's you know, done a lot of reading and is very careful versus the Trader Joe's and the Whole Foods are a little more mainstream. They wanna sort of whitewash their healthy because they really do want flavor. They really, 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 really do. And now I don't know how much has changed since Amazon bought them, but it's a really interesting idea around what customer is gonna be attracted uh, to different stores because of the, the, the look and feel. HEB, you guys know, has a huge variety of organics. In fact, when I worked for HEB, it was very clearly noted uh, to the leadership that um, HEB has more organics than Whole Foods by far. But we try as HB, if not we, they, they try to make sure that they have a wide range of customer base. You know, Texans love their HEB. So they don't really wave that flag so loudly on organics because they, they sometimes want to also um, attract the just flavor, baby. Just give me flavor, right? So it's interesting how the grocery stores have a pretty big impact on what happens with the products that they, that they use. So we know that there are thickeners. We know that there are some that are questionable in the food uh, manufacturing world. We know there are some naturally occurring ones that we can use. What are we worried about? So if we looked at carrageenan as one of the manufactured products, let's look at it a little closer. So carrageenan, what the heck is it? It's actually made from a seaweed 
which doesn't seem bad, right? How bad can that be? It's natural. Um, it's actually a, a soluble fiber. So that's good too, right? We always say we want more soluble fiber and we sure want more plants. How could that be bad? Um, there is um, a term that we learn when we dig a little deeper. And um, let me see if I, I'm gonna make sure I spell it right. Degraded carrageenan. Kind of like the whole idea with the canola oil. You know how that's a very esoteric component of how does it get out of the seed? Same idea here. How does the soluble fiber get out of the seaweed? And how is it further processed? This is where we have now a potential cancer risk. So the advocates against synthetic or alternative food additives are going to be this group that says, no, wait a minute, whistleblowers, uh, we are the whistleblowers. Are you sure we should put this into our food? Let's, let's investigate. And so you've heard me talk about how we investigate, right? We, we do lab animals and we, uh, we give them a large amount of whatever the product is and we see what happens. And of course we know we're not rats, but some of us are rats. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> we, we know that our bodies are not gonna respond the same, but we also know that if you give huge doses of you know, uh, chemical A to animal A, are we really gonna have the same result of normal eating of humans? So of course those are good issues to bring up and that's the other side of the conversation. But this degraded form of carrageenan is where there's a questionable uh, situation. So there are organizations that are really trying to get carrageenan out of our food. Um, but we always have this balance effect, the USDA and the FDA. So let me make sure I get this right. The uh, National Organic Standards Board, National Organic Standards Board. This is the group that says, you know what, if we're going to have an organic food, we don't want anything that's been degraded or changed or whatever. So if you're gonna put seaweed in the food, that's one thing, but if you're gonna use it as a special item for this or that, no, we can't do that. We have, because we're, re we're worried about the, te the uh, chemicals. So the National Organic Safety Board is the one that really looks at what we're putting in foods. So we don't wanna always risk that. The other group, is of course the FDA. Now who does the FDA represent? Well, we're supposed to represent people, but also kind of they're right in the middle. They have food companies and we, we as you know, the US, we support our farmers, we help out the industry and we're trying to help people. So we're like on this teeter totter, who do we help the most, right? And so the FDA doesn't always agree with the safety board. Sometimes they go, no, 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 that, those studies, they're not, don't worry about it. They're just on rats. It's not the same as people. So let's not um, mess up the apple cart because there isn't another product like carrageenan that is gonna help get all these wonderful foods. And we know how important it is to sell all these wonderful foods because they would make our people happy and maybe fat because they overeat on them. Another, another topic right? Or um, if we don't have carrageenan, the cost is going to go way up and it's going to make it the, the foods difficult for people to access. So you see there's, there's always this balance of for and against food products. And the organics board is really not winning this particular battle. Um, the FDA still said, nope, we're going to still allow it under GRAS, G. R A S generally regarded as safe because we don't have enough evidence. Now I'll tell you what, there actually is a, um, a legal battle going on. A couple in California did win a battle that proved that their carrageenan um, intake was related. No, actually that's not quite right. The glyphosate from a food that also had carrageenan uh, caused cancer. So they won a huge lawsuit. 
So people studies are probably going to be out there. Now we have anecdotal evidence like this one couple that can actually prove causation of their cancer to something in the food. Um, but I feel like we're probably a ways away from getting a, a broad study that's going to look at large groups of people and say, nope, unequivocally, this product needs to be taken out of foods. I want to hear your comments. So I didn't forget. So the degraded issue is it. And we know that there are some items that are generally regarded as safe. Um, when we think of overall risk factors, like what are we afraid of with carrageenan and this whole degraded thing, we know cancer might be it. There's some other, you know, obviously less severe than cancer, but could really um, be the, the, the trend of causing people to have malaise. So we know that sometimes thickeners like carrageenan can cause irritable bowel, um, other kinds of GI distress. So, um, and also gallbladder irritation. So even something as simple as just not feeling good from substances that are in our milks and ice creams and yogurts, um, I bet some of us have experienced uh, I definitely have. I, I tried using a non-dairy uh, rice-based chocolate milk. And just like that one I bought in the, the, the gas station, it was delicious. So I probably overdrank it because it was so darn good. I'm hot, I'm thirsty, I'll have a swig. I'm hot, I'm thirsty, I want some sweet, I'll take a swig. You know, too much. Anytime the food tastes so good, it falls into that food cocaine category, you better just kick it out of your fridge. <laughs> Even if it's all organic and, you know, purely wholesome with cream and, and nothing else. So that's another topic, but there seems to be some irritation really around these other thickeners, not just carrageenan, but you know, guar gum and some of these others that are made from the polysaccharides. There's a word I want you to remember, polysaccharides. So polysaccharides in and of itself is a soluble fiber. These, when we're talking about these non-nutritive thickeners, that's a different story because we're not really adding vitamins and minerals. We're adding some carbon chains that don't really get digested. So think about that. And I've shown you a, a video a while back in the GI tract. When you eat things that swell, it can cause irritation in the lining of the small intestine and the large intestine. So it's one thing to have vegetables that you eat that have with it vitamins and minerals and sugars that can be degraded and consumed versus a non-nutritive where it doesn't really give you calories, right? Or it, it doesn't get absorbed. It stays in your gut. That's where we start getting some of these issues that it's kind of hurting your intestine. Make sense? So <clears throat> it's a little different. Um, poly means multiple saccharides or sugars. So multiple sugars grouped together. You know, in the science world, we just think of it as carbon chain and then little hydrogens off here. And the body likes these because we get energy. But if these bonds don't really break and it goes through our gut unchanged and it just pulls fluid in, a little bit of that probably isn't bad, but too much of it starts to be a problem. Okay, so we now know that polysaccharides that are from cooked vegetables are wonderful because it comes with a lot of good things and it's not been processed in a way like that degraded situation or the hexane um, processing that heats the food, puts a chemical on it, and hopefully we get it all away when we're trying to rinse it off, okay? So now what I want us to do is think about the other side of the coin. So I talked to you about the uh, National Organic Safety Board. Um, let's jump to this one for a second. Root Cause Medical Clinics. This is a lady and you can, I was gonna have a little video for you, but you can go to the website and I'll share them with you. Um, RootCauseMedicalClinics.com. But this, when I Google um, carrageenan or um, food thickeners, her website pops up. And her, she's, she calls herself an MD but she's not really a doctor. She's a functional medicine practitioner. A lot of those are popping up. 
And I bring this one up because she's got a lot of uh, erroneous thinking in her, in her copy around food additives. She says, well, for one thing, if you ever um, are trying to make a food healthier by putting in a soluble fiber and you sell it at a fast food restaurant, you know it must be bad. Kind of illogical thinking. I mean, we would hope someday that a fast food restaurant would have something healthy. She also says, secondly, it's made with all kinds of GMOs, which are bad, period. We're learning that that's not really true. There's all kinds, and wait till next week, because I'm gonna dive into more of the genetic modification. Um, that's not necessarily true either. Genetic modification has been around in our food uh, systems for hundreds and hundreds of years. We can think of it as basically trying to um, grow plants for characteristics that we want. Just like when you want to, you know, uh, raise puppies and you have a really good puppy in the group, she, she or he obeys you, is, doesn't fight with its, you know, siblings, you think, that's when I want to breed. So you pull that one out and you make sure you don't, you know, spay or neuter and you have another family with that puppy. You're, you're making sure you want those characteristics so you're breeding that. That's right. That's no big deal. That is a, a, a type of genetic modification. So next week, when we delve into it a little further, you'll see that GMO should not be categorically bad. When we have hype, hype um, people that try to scare tactic us into avoiding foods or products or types, I want us to really notice their illogical process because that's where we make wrong decisions and we start to just trust people because they sound like they know what they're saying rather than us having the deductive reasoning to really go through the steps. So um, I'm sure she is a great lady, but her thought process is irrational because she's making decisions based on incomplete information. She also says that all um, carrageenan or um, soy products or um, meat alternatives are um, filled with glyphosate, glyphosate, which is that um, Roundup chemical. Um, again, a really interesting topic, but we haven't been able to unequivocally say that just because it makes it on California's, uh, California's Prop 65 list that it causes cancer. They're trying to be really careful to make sure that uh, their consumers are aware of ingredients, but we still are not getting enough real good data to be able to say for sure. Okay, so anyway, um, naturopath and MDs don't have all the answers. When you read through some of the YouTube and social media discussion points, just be really um, kind of a devil's advocate when you're listening to their rationale. Not every issue is clear cut. Same thing with this one, the 12taste.com. Um, this one's really interesting because it gives some criteria uh, as far as what additives are used and what they're for, especially the gums and thickeners. Healthline is a great one too. This is one I always go to when I'm taking um, notes for your classes. It's written by reputable sources. Um, it gives a little snippet and maybe some links to follow for more information. So you can type in a question like, you know, food thickeners and gums, are they good for me? Or, you know, carrageenan, what's all this, you know, talk? And it'll give you some great info around the topic. One item that is so popular is the Beyond Beef. And so that's the one I wanna talk about now. It is, a whole conglomerate of non-meat products. And I know some of you might have tried them. Um, some of the ways it describes it, I think is so interesting. I'm, I'm actually gonna look at my little notes here because I think it's so funny. It is juicy like a burger, like you would expect. Um, it, it, it bleeds, which kind of sounds gross to me, but it's true we want our burger to be juicy. Do we want the juices that come out of it to be red? Yeah, yeah no? <laughs> I know it seems a little odd, um, but here is one of the scare tactic groups. This is the root cause again. Uh, it's laden with cancer-causing chemicals. 
Okay, that's the root cause comments around it. Um, now, if you go to the Beyond Beef website, what it says is it is non-GMO, which, you know, of course that again is wrapped around scare tactics, but that's supposed to be a good thing. It also tells us, get, it's yes, it's meat and it's made from plants and its ingredients are really clean. It says it has pea protein and it describes it. So it kind of brings it down to the basics. It says, we bring all the ingredients together that you need, protein, complex carbs, and fats. And we, we do magic and make this burger from plants and has it, makes it taste just like a burger that you want from meat. Okay, so my mind goes to, well, what if I don't want it to taste like meat? I've decided to eat plant-based because I don't want meat, <laughs> right? And so it's kind of playing on that line too, I think. But it's the kinds of fats you'll love. So it uses um, coconut oil. And again, the uh, special canola oil that's you know very consciously produced. And it has beet juice. And then it gives us this nice little picture of a potato, but it only has less than 1% of potato starch. It doesn't really have any actual potato pulp in it. <laughs> when you read the ingredients, it's less than 1% of potato starch, which is a thickener, by the way, just with a different name. So we think of potato as safe. We have this beautiful, wholesome picture and it says, and minerals, thanks mother earth. And it's got a picture of a beet and it has all these great things. And in all fairness, when we go to the product details, 100% plant-based, it says no soy and kosher. No soy and kosher. What does kosher mean? Anybody kosher here? Anybody know what kosher means? Yes? Right, there's very specific steps that we don't let milk and meat touch or even made in the same area. Does that have any bearing on its health though? Now, if you're Jewish, maybe having a, a kitchen that's blessed by a rabbi does in fact make it healthier. Um, but the mainstream won't even be clear on what that means. But because it's a flag that's been waved, we figured, oh, it must have some value, <laughs> right? So, but let's talk about this one. Is soy bad? No, soy is not bad. Even if you have a cancer history, soy is not bad. Now, highly processed soy in a pill or a powder is not good for different reasons, right? So it's really trying to change its, its, its um, personality. It's made with pea protein, expeller pressed canola oil, refined coconut oil, rice protein, and natural flavors and dried yeast. So it's trying to let us know that it doesn't have carrageenan, it doesn't have thickeners. Now it probably used to because there's so many other websites that point the finger at it having all these bad things in it. So it might've been evolving over time, which is definitely a good thing. Listening to the other side, right? The ones that are looking for healthy and wanting flavor. So I like that it, maybe it is improving, but I still love to say, what if you were to make a bean burger and add a little potato starch and a little bit of extra virgin olive oil into your bean burger and put it on the grill. Now, of course, we could talk about the grill and you know the party's over, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> we don't want to sear it and get all those uh, bad hydrocarbon amines or um, anyway, I know it, it feels like it never ends. But I think the good news is that even if you did try a Beyond Beef burger, it's really trying. Um, and when we go back to our best foods list and decide, are we going to always use these products and how, what are we going to put with them? So if it becomes something that is a mainstay and you love the meatballs or the burgers, look at the ingredients, see if it passes your test and it might be absolutely fine. Um, the agricultural marketing service is another one that has been involved. Now this is part of the USDA and it will give you a list of foods and products that are GRAS, generally recognized as safe, and it'll also have some products that you wanna stay away from. Surprisingly, food companies do not have to get FDA approval on the ingredients they use. That shocked me. Food companies do not have to get FDA approval. So 
as we are going through and learning about products that are put into foods, you know, we sort of have the understanding that everything's been tested. And that's just not always the case. They can self-declare that everything in my product is safe. Yeah, so that's not quite true. That's why it's not a bad idea to have some of these resources like the USDA that kind of at least guide us. There's another really good one, uh, this one, Food Safety News. Food Safety News. And again, these are websites that you could go to and see what they have as, as far as a, uh, a safety list, some warnings. But again, I mean, this could be your full-time job, <laughs> right? This could be your full-time job. And so I, that's why I, I really preface this whole topic of, you know, think through um, your best foods list, because we always want to go back to that and know that a wide variety of foods minimizes your risk of exposure to any potential carcinogens, because we know that even if you ate, you know, raw vegan all day long, you're exposed to stuff, right? Yeah. Um, cool. There's one more I wanted to show you. And let's see, this is the Cornucopia Institute. Again, another website. This one's kind of cool because it tells you about stores and different um, products that they carry. And you'll have like, um, which one did I highlight? Clover, Sonoma. So it'll have a little green check if it's good. It'll have a yellow sign warning if it carries products that have questionable ingredients. So remember I mentioned the, the um, retail groceries manuf um, uh, group, Re I forget the acronym, but it's the people that run the grocery store kind of principles and philosophies. And they'll have scientists on, on their board to kind of decide what are we gonna allow? So it's interesting to me that like the people that run HEB could decide what do we want on our shelves more so than a governmental agency. So we consumers can look for the USDA organic um, uh, circle, but even there, they kind of are fighting on what can be under that label and what gets to be taken out. So the carrageenan was that topic. Some of the advocates of the organic board say, we don't want carrageenan. FDA says, no, nope, we're going to leave it in. So they have some control, but not all. So anyway, this is a neat little, um, um, brochure that will give you some information on products. Here's one, Mission Organics. Oh yeah, I put a note on my um, my tablet for this one because Mission Organics is a corn tortilla. W we, would we pick corn tortillas as a healthy version over flour? Of course we would, right? And if we look in their ingredient list, they're going to have carrageenan. They're going to have other dough softeners and, and conditioners. The fear is that um, you have that, plus you have the, if it's not organic, it's going to have corn that has a higher percentage of the glyphosate on the corn. So you get the double whammy. So anyway, it's a fun little one. And I, I know I've mentioned um, the Center for Science and the Public Interest. They have a similar little list of um, stores. Again, Trader Joe's has all kinds of red, red exclamation points. They carry a lot of products that have thickeners. Because again, Trader Joe's, even though it's considered kind of all natural and kind of the hippie-ish, you know, love story, they uh, are also price driven. So the products that use these ingredients are really trying to get a lower price margin and they're very inexpensive, which, you know, at, at Paros Bakery, we use chia seeds as a thickener and it's very expensive. So, you know, we all have to balance out um, how we work all that. Okay, so in our last couple of minutes, what I wanna do is create our best foods list and a day. I mean, you know, I, I do advocate doing more plant-based and I do advocate um, trying new foods. And so, you know, just like um, the day when I got the chocolate milk, I was thinking, boy, that's not all my best foods list. There I have it. And it's just sounded delicious, so of course. Um, when we think of our protein foods and our carbohydrates, we, we really want to think of our base foods that we 
use 90% of the time. If we occasionally want to have a meat alternative, what, what could I put? Any, any meat alternatives? Morningstar Morning Star Farms? Mm -hmm. Morningstar Farms, burger. So, and, and I didn't look this one up, but I think we should, Irene. Um, we should look it up in our resources. So we're gonna look up in the cornucopia and see if uh, stores carry that one. And if it does, then does it have a, uh, a red diamond or a yellow diamond? And we can look it up. So Nature's Plus, Morningstar Farms. I don't see it. So my next step would be to check another resource and just know. I mean, we can always look at the label too of Morningstar Farms. We could go to its website and see what's in it. And if we can pronounce all the ingredients, we're probably okay. The, the Beyond Burger one does have a lot of vitamins and minerals added. So, you know, those, some of those chemical terms, um, if you're not sure, text me and I'll, I'll help you. I love how Irene texts me all the time about foods. What do you think about that one? So I love it. And, and that's where it's so fun to have a group like this. You know, we get to share ideas and um, compare notes. So we're, we could sometimes have a, um, a meat substitute we could also experiment with lentil burgers on the grill. Um, the last time I went to a barbecue, which was a while ago, I actually brought a beet burger, a beet burger that's made with walnuts and lentils and black beans and a whole lot of beets. Yeah, it's messy when you make them, but you make a whole bunch and freeze them and then you take them with you and it's, they're delicious. And it didn't really bleed, <laughs> but it was reddish and they're beautiful. And so it was kind of a fun thing. Um, the next question will be, if we have our burger, what kind of, what kind of bread are we gonna use? Cause that's the other big issue, right? Do we go keto? Do we go vegan? Do we go gluten free? Do we do no dough conditioners? Do we do sprouted grain, <laughs> right? Uh, or do we leave the bun out altogether and use a lettuce leaf? Anybody wanna throw out a, a suggestion? Personally, I would do a bun. I think a bun is so important on a burger. And in all fairness, we don't serve a bun on our turkey burger here. Um, you know, in meal prep, it doesn't work because you put it all together and it gets soggy. But we have a keto bun that's working really well on our, our Suzette chicken salad. So, you know, you can do both. Um, at home, if I have a burger, I would look for the um, Food for Life brand that says sprouted grain and they make a pretty good bun, but you have to have it at home because you've got to toast it because you can't really eat it right out of the package. So again, our palate has gotten so acclimated to the qualities of a bun. What should it be? It should be not crumbly. It should be soft. It should be the certain size and shape and you should be able to bite into it and it's lightly crispy and soft, right? All of those qualities, the manufacturers are hard at work to make sure they can create. And it's going to be a while before we can find all those qualities in a bun that does not have dough conditioners. So the, the different ingredients that are helping to soften the texture, adding moisture and emulsifying the product. But I would say a bun. So if you want to just have a whole wheat bun, organic nature's harvest whole wheat bun, and you're not celiac, you don't have a sen sensitivity, would that be a good choice? Yeah, exactly. Yes, I would, I would still say it's better to include a bun than to not have a bun at all and then go have a piece of um, apple pie and ice cream because you're saving the carbs. And it's like, really? <laughs> and I tell you how many people do that. They, they don't eat the bun, but then they are hungry later, so they have four chocolate chip cookies. So I would say use a bun, pick a better one if you can. Um, if you really hate bread, well, sure, use a lettuce leaf and then have some beans or some potatoes on the side, right? I love it. Way to go. Of course you can. Yeah. And that opens up more options. I have not found a pita with no dough conditioners or, you know, the carrageenan. So see if you can find one because to your point, I bet they do exist, Rachel. I really do. And now let's put some, some fat on our burger. Because we don't really need to rely on the bun, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the meat or even the meat alternative to have all the 
the, the juice coming out, right? We could do all kinds of things and make it a healthy fat that we add. What should we put on our burger? Yes, avocado, tomato, you bet. You could even do sprouts. There we go. I was going to say you could even do some kind of spread. Anybody ever use hummus? You can make hummus with the garbanzo beans or you can use a mayo. Um, there are better mayos. So this is where the whole idea of your best foods list is so valuable because you go from good to great. So if you love mayo, find the very best quality of mayo. And how do we decide what is the very best quality? We look at the ingredients, if we can pronounce them, if there isn't a lot of weird things added, it's probably a good choice. It doesn't have to be vegan, because really to make a good mayonnaise, you probably do need to have eggs. But there are good, some good ones showing up. But I don't want you to replace the eggs with canola oil or palm shortening or other ingredients in order to make the texture right to go healthier. Now, if you're allergic to eggs, makes sense. If you have a, a reason to take eggs out for philosophical reasons, because you don't want to hurt the baby chicken, then go to the other one. But don't make that choice for health. Earth Balance Butter, we use here all the time. But really, when I do a comparison of Earth Balance Butter and Organic Palm Shortening, that one's not as good. It's got all kinds of other stuff in there. So as far as clean product, the organic palm shortening is probably better. So when we make our frosting and we want to make it, you know, allergen friendly, we don't want it to have soy or of course, um, gluten or other um, food additives, the palm shortening is pretty good. So you see the process? I really want you to have the takeaway that there are great um, websites to learn from and I'll share more with you. And there's also a lot of equivocation in the industry. So we just wanna do our very best to make sure we know what we're picking and why. Yeah, yeah, let's do cheese. And, and really, I'm glad you brought that up because cheese is much better when we call it what it is. Don't use cheese as a protein. Now, it's a bonus that some cheese has some protein and some calcium, but I don't think it's our best interest to use it as a protein food because it is going to have some protein. Because when you look at it ounce for ounce or calorie for calorie, what's it a lot higher in? Fat. Yes, a lot higher in fat. So that's, you know, that's not the best choice. Um, a lot of people that go vegetarian, and this was the case for sure a few years ago, um, they would eat so much cheese going, oh darn, I have to eat more cheese because I need my protein. <laughs> and they would start gaining weight. Why is this happening? I'm not eating meat. It's like, yeah, but you're eating a whole lot of calories. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing uh, this time with me. And we have lots more fun things to go through next week. So we'll see you soon. Thank mm -hmm. you.